video, finally, we're going to talk about the end of the New Deal and Great Depression. So um, by 1937, we start to see that New Deal programs are starting to end. Um, one of the reasons why this is, is because there's going to be um, a growing sense, uh, especially with Roosevelt, that the federal deficit is too big. Um, as we know, a lot of these New Deal programs were quite pricey. So FDR starts uh, cutting spending in 1937, and the result of it is going to be a pretty severe recession, um, increased unemployment, and in general, uh, a a loss of popular support for the New Deal. So basically, you know, you get a sense that the New Deal was probably not sustainable in the sense that FDR even realizes that he's spending entirely too much money to enact these programs. And one could ask the question, what really would have happened to the economic recovery if it weren't for the U.S. involvement in World War II? But we don't actually know what would have happened, but most people agree that ultimately what really pulled the U.S. economy out of the Depression was um, the growing amount of jobs that were created because of World War II, right? Not really the New Deal programs, which really, if anything, sort of alleviated the pains of the Great Depression. It didn't cure it. It treated it rather than cured it, if that makes sense. Um, one of the things that uh, FDR does in um, uh, because a lot of his New Deal programs are actually challenged by the Supreme Court um, the majority of the court justices that were there when he first became president were um, appointed by Republicans and ultimately uh, were not very favorable of some of his New Deal programs. And so because uh, many of his programs were challenged by the court, he attempts to do something called pack the court. Okay, and what this was was he basically was trying to increase the size of the Supreme Court and appoint more New Deal friendly judges. Now, there was a major critique of this. Many people questioned whether or not this was constitutional. Just so you guys know, the Constitution itself actually does not explicitly say how many justices should be on the Supreme Court, but there have been um, subsequent Judiciary Acts that have, um, and the most recent one was in, uh, geez, it was in, uh, like the 1840s, I think, and that one um, set the level at nine. Um, and But ultimately, FDR was making the argument that since the Constitution didn't actually articulate how big the court could be, that he could increase it. So he attempts to um, to get this act passed. It was called the Court Packing Bill, um, which would have made the court bigger. Um, but Congress actually ends up uh, uh, striking it down. So the Court Packing Bill does not pass. Um, but FDR in some ways kind of get what's he gets what he wants in the long term because most of the justices that were on the court at that point were elderly. So many of them died when he was in office. And so by the time we get to 1942 during World War II, um, all but two of the justices on the Supreme Court are going to be FDR appointees. In terms of uh, women's experience in the New Deal, it's, it's uh, sort of mixed. Um, you are going to see that women who get involved in some reform and relief efforts are going to really increase their influence in the public sphere. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt was a very active first lady, and she's sort of a key example of how the New Deal could be a very empowering experience for women. She was seen as the guardian of human values. She really wanted to see that the people who were suffering in the Great Depression would be protected rather than lost in a sea of red tape. And uh, Eleanor Roosevelt really gave the general female population the sense that they too could be very active in alleviating some of the problems with the Depression. In terms of African Americans in the New Deal, um, in the early stages, the New Deal does not actually, you know, do anything that distinguishes people based on race. Um, you are going to see that the National Relief Administration had codes that actually allowed blacks to get paid less than whites. So to a certain extent, some of the earlier New Deal policies are not really um, progressive in the way that they see race. Um, however, as we, go f as we go forward, we are going to see that FDR is going to become more racially con uh, conscious in some of his New Deal programs. So for example, with the Works Progress Administration projects, there was discrimination against blacks, and FDR stepped in and banned that discrimination. So because of his intervention, many more African Americans were able to find jobs through the WPA. 
And lastly, one of the best examples of FDR's attention to race, unlike many previous presidents, was the fact that he uh, established what was called a black cabinet in the White House. It was led by a woman, too, so sort of a double minority there, a woman named Mary Bethune, and she directly advised FDR on issues that pertain to the African-American community. So because of the creation of the black cabinet, on the one hand, you had African-Americans re-engaged in politics for the first time really since that brief window during Reconstruction when you had black men get elected for office. So it's sort of a precursor to the civil rights movement that's going to ignite in about 20 years. And it's also just a really good example of how the Democratic Party is going to start to pick up minority voters because it is conscious about their unique experience, right? Um, so by 1936, because of this, you're going to see that the majority of African-American voters are going to start voting purely Democrat. And this is something that is continuing well into the present day. Um, <clears throat> so um, you are going to see that uh, there are other limitations. The New Deal, for example, is very, um, it doesn't really do anything for Mexican Americans, for example. So there are uh, certainly limits in terms of how the New Deal approaches race. Um, we already talked about the federal deficit. So uh, uh, two more things to mention. One thing is that you see that by 1938, many Americans are sort of disgruntled with uh, the state of the economy. Um, since FDR cut spending the year before, there's going to be actually an increasing frustration with the Democratic Party. And by 1938, you're going to see that more uh, people start to vote for uh, Republicans. Um, and so it, it sort of solidifies the idea that further New Deal programs would be very difficult to implement. And so you might ask the question, you know, why in 1940 wasn't FDR voted out of office if he seemed to be unpopular starting in 1937-1938? Well, the very simple answer to that question is that the U.S. Um, was threatened with the possibility of going into World War Two at that point. So ultimately, you're going to have the threat of national security trump economic issues. Um, so the beginning of World War II is, is really what solidifies the end of the New Deal because it's not, no longer necessary. The World War II economy is essentially going to create the jobs that the New Deal previously was almost like forcing to be created, right? So they were created organically um, rather than having the government spend massive amount of, amounts of money to create those jobs. So the New Deal uh, and the Great Depression do leave a major legacy in terms of political development. Um, this is one of the first major challenges we see to a capitalist economy um, that is limited, uh, albeit we are going to see that after World War II is over, there's going to be an increasing um, stepping away um, from a lot of these very involved um, uh, programs which are somewhat socialistic in nature, but not entirely. Some of the programs that are enacted by the New Deal are still present today and are still incredibly significant. So social security, for example, is something that one could see as a challenge to capitalism and still exists and is so popular among the elderly population that it's pretty difficult to see it ever going away. You're also going to see that uh, because of the emergency situations of the Great Depression, the executive branch is going to gain power. FDR, because especially just looking at the 100 days, FDR was a very dynamic and active president who, in many ways, really put pressure on Congress to enact the legislation that he was pushing for. Um, you see that he is exerting, or he's trying to at least exert power over the Supreme Court by trying to pack the court. Um, and he becomes a very prominent public figure just in the sense that he's constantly communicating with his people. The fireside chats give you a sense of how present he was. Um, so ultimately, many people start to associate the general political process much more just with the president um, than previous people would. And I think that this is also a continuity to today. Quite frankly, if you really think about the political process, we probably should pay much more attention to people who are in the Senate and the House and the Supreme Court. We tend to get way too washed up with who's in the White House. And I think that there is some lingering uh, connection to this era, right? suddenly the association is that all government seems to be accomplished in the White House, which still isn't true. But many people kind of feel like that figurehead is someone that they want to really focus on um, in terms of actually enacting policy, right, even if that's not true. 
You're also, of course, going to see that the federal government is getting increasingly involved in the political process and also providing economic relief. So again, I see that also as a caveat to the major change in capitalism that I was saying before, right? We definitely have the government, you know, becoming much more involved. And also another major legacy is that the Democratic Party is shifting, right? I was saying that earlier. So you're going to have this Democratic Party that, you know, during the ages of Reconstruction were mostly white Southerners to suddenly a party that is now encompassing the biggest change in my mind is that Democrats are now recruiting African Americans, which is something that would be unheard of during the Reconstruction era when, uh, you know, it was, of course, the Republican Party that pushed the 13th, 14th and 15th Amendments into ratification. Um, so the fact that you have African Americans who were almost solidly Republican when they first got the right to vote now voting chiefly Democratic gives you a major sense of this party realignment that takes place. And this party realignment uh, is major, and the next one isn't really going to happen until the 1970s or so, when Richard Nixon starts to recruit many more Southerners into the Republican Party. So that is the general discussion about the Great Depression. Uh, we will be able to get through this fairly quickly, I think. We'll be done with it after this week. Basically, our goal is to do one chapter a week until we review for the EP. So we're fast paced, but that's the goal. And remember, by the time we get to early May, we'll be done with this beast. So enjoy the rest of your weekend and I will see